I'm pleased to have this opportunity to give you some understanding of the Underground Railroad in general and the role of Seneca County, New York, especially the southern part of the county. This program is very timely as we are nearly in the month of February, which is traditionally known as Black History Month. It is safe to say that Seneca County was a hotbed of underground railroad activism in the decades leading up to the Civil War. This was also true of the other counties in the Finger Lakes. But before I can discuss specific sites and people in Southern Seneca County, I want to cover some basic information about the Underground Railroad. Underground Railroad history, of course, takes place before the Civil War. The term Underground Railroad can be misleading in that it wasn't typically underground at all. And in many cases of freedom seekers fleeing north, no railroad itself was ever involved. That term underground railroad probably came into use because at the peak times of the operation of this underground railroad, somewhat in the late 1840s and primarily in the 1850s, it was also the time period when railroad construction was at its peak throughout the North, especially. I am going to use the term Underground Railroad in its broadest meaning to refer to any form of anti slavery activity, including but not limited to the actual loosely organized network of providing assistance to runaway slaves so that they could reach freedom in Northern states or in Canada. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 made it illegal to give any kind of aid to runaway slaves. So Underground Railroad Act usually were done in secret. However, Although it was a secretive operation, historians in recent years have learned much information about Underground Railroad activity by studying census data, subscriptions that people made to various anti-slavery publications, looking at probated wills of people, and other things. These documents help to give us some real insight into how extensive Underground Railroad activity was in the years preceding the Civil War, that many people were openly defying the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, apparently believing there was a higher moral law that must be followed. In this map, you see that the routes that runaway slaves on southern plantations might take went in different directions. More specifically, if you were escaping a plantation in a deep southern state, you probably headed to Texas or to islands in the Caribbean where slavery had already been abolished. From the more northern parts of the South, what we call the Upper South, such as Maryland, runaway slaves would head north. I have been using the term runaway slave so far, but I want to clarify that term. Today, we use the term freedom seeker to refer to what were called fugitive slaves or runaway slaves in the years before the Civil War. Now, I will be likely to use the term runaway slave in my program today and fugitive slave when I should be using the term freedom seeker, perhaps. But I'm going to use the terminology that was in use in the years before the Civil War and still has common usage yet 
today. The anti-slavery movement was very much a part of the reforming zeal that comes out of the Second Great Awakening of the 1820s through the 1840s. This was a religious revivalism. The Reverend Charles Grandison Finney, shown here, and other preachers led this religious revivalist movement, advocating a new religious viewpoint that man could determine right from wrong and would therefore do what is right and avoid doing what was wrong. Closely related to that came the idea that where you saw a wrong in society, you would want to do away with that wrong. So in other words, a reforming zeal. Upstate New York became known as the burned over district, and it was the central area of this second great awakening. Between 1830 and 1850, over 200 churches in this central western New York area became known as come outer churches, embracing this new religious philosophy. This viewpoint was that people can determine right from wrong and will do what is right, leading to this reform zeal. There were many different ways in which this reform zeal was manifested. One is doing away with slavery. Others were women's rights, temperance, prison reform, and education and religion itself. In the summer of 1848, numerous meetings of the Free Soil Party were held in Seneca Falls. The Free Soil Party people were determined to not let any territories that the United States gained from Mexico in the Mexican War become slave states in the Union. Many of the names that appeared in this newspaper notice shown here were names of people that were prominent businessmen in Seneca Falls and Waterloo, with only a few in the more southern part of the county. As I've suggested, the term Underground Railroad in its narrow meaning refers to providing help to freedom seekers escaping from their plantation enslavement to reach freedom in Canada or places in the North where they would feel safe. The Underground Railroad in this sense really flourished after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed by Congress. The Fugitive Slave Act was part of a series of laws that made up what is known as the Compromise of 1850, which included the admission of California as a state. The Fugitive Slave Act mandated that law enforcement officials, such as county sheriffs and so on, had to arrest anyone suspected of being a runaway slave or to arrest anyone providing assistance to a fugitive slave. Abolitionists in the North were so opposed to this Fugitive Slave Act that they became more determined than ever to defy this law that they considered immoral and make much more concerted efforts to help freedom seekers. Here you see some typical examples of posters for runaway slaves. Freedom seekers were considered to be a valuable piece of property by the plantation owner. As a result, it was common to offer significant rewards to those who would help a runaway slave be returned to his or her master. Some people, commonly called slave catchers, tried to make a living by rounding up runaway slaves and returning them to their master. It has been written that Harriet Tubman, the famous conductor of the Underground Railroad, usually left with her passengers on a Saturday night because it would not be until Monday morning 
that a plantation owner could get to a print shop and have reward posters printed. Many Quakers were actively involved in the Underground Railroad. This is largely because the Society of Friends members believed in the innate equality of all people, male and female, white and non-white. Now, I want you to think for a moment, what does it mean to be free? Think of yourself as a fugitive slave, a freedom seeker. What would it mean to be free to such a freedom seeker in the years before the Civil War? Now, who was involved in anti-slavery activity? We can generalize to say that all kinds of people were involved. Obviously, some people of great wealth and high political position would be able to do more to advance the anti-slavery cause they embraced than would a lower class working person. But we should take pride in acknowledging the contributions of all classes of people who did whatever they could, however great or small the amount, to promote the cause. But I don't want you to conclude that all people in the North were anti-slavery, because that is not true. Some groups, such as Quakers, had a high proportion of their members involved in anti-slavery activity. This was, as I suggested, because of the Quaker belief in the innate equality of everyone. In the 1840s, new churches that I referred to, those come-outer churches, were strongly anti-slavery. Now, the most famous of these come-outer churches in Seneca County was the Wesleyan Methodist Congregation established in Seneca Falls. Remember that I am using the term Underground Railroad in its broadest meaning. And so there were many kinds of Underground Railroad activity, and they're listed here. You will note in this chart that there were many African Americans living in upstate New York counties before the Civil War in 1850 census data, during or just before the Civil War 1860 census data, and after the Civil War 1870 census data. Typically, the number for these various counties declined in 1860 compared to 1850. And this was probably because of the tensions following the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, leading to many freedom seekers that were living in these counties to flee to Canada, at least temporarily, until the Civil War was over and the 13th Amendment formally abolished slavery. Here you see a picture of Garrett Smith first cousin of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. He was probably the largest landowner in New York State before the Civil War. In her autobiography, Elizabeth Cady Stanton told how she was converted to anti-slavery beliefs while visiting at her cousin's home, of Garrett Smith, that is, in Peterborough near Utica. When New York abolished property qualifications initially for white males, these property qualifications were kept, however, for black males. So Garrett Smith donated as much as 40 acres of his property to many free black males so that each of those black males could meet the property qualifications to be able to vote. This Syracuse Post-Standard article shows that in the year 1846 alone, 
Garrett Smith donated more than 120,000 acres of his properties in the Adirondacks to free black men. Because of women's rights history being so much a part of Seneca County's history, I have to add this frame. It is probably safe to say that the Seneca Falls Convention of July 1848 would not have taken place in 1848 or in Seneca Falls, except for the fact that the five ladies who organized this first women's rights convention were all involved in the anti-slavery or Underground Railroad movement. This map shows some of the routes that freedom seekers took through New York State. If you look at the center, you will see a route that comes up from Pennsylvania, up to Elmira, and then up along Seneca Lake. Once the freedom seekers reached the Geneva Waterloo or Seneca Falls area, they had the options of pr proceeding straight north to Pulteneyville and then across the lake there, or proceeding west to Rochester to St. Catharines in Ontario, Canada, or east to Auburn in Syracuse and then to Oswego and across Lake Ontario. From those cities, they would ultimately make to freedom in Canada, which had abolished slavery before it happened in the United States as a result of our Civil War. Here is a map showing some likely Underground Railroad routes for these freedom seekers. At the right, I have enlarged the portion for Seneca County. Note ex how extensively there are routes around Cayuga Lake. I need to remind you that because providing aid to fugitive slaves was a federal crime according to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the Underground Railroad activity tended to operate very much in secret. So we can't be sure of the actual routes taken by these freedom seekers. Carol Kamen, the Tompkins County historian, said in a 2019 Ithaca Journal article, my opinion is that the route north was uncertain at most stages, that it was plastic, meaning that it went one way one time and another way the next, depending upon who was available, who could help, what dangers were perceived, and it also had to do with luck. Even here in the Finger Lakes region, you need to remember that many were prejudiced against blacks in general and that there was the constant fear of slave catchers so that the actual routes taken might vary somewhat. John Jones was the famous Underground Railroad station master in Elmira, New York. He himself was a fugitive slave. Most of the freedom seekers who came to the Geneva, Waterloo, Seneca Falls area came up through Pennsylvania to Elmira, where John Jones then assisted them on their way north from Elmira. Many freedom seekers who left Elmira headed to Ithaca. In 1833, Ithaca's African-American community organized a church at the home of its first pastor, the Reverend Henry Johnson. The two-story church building with a tower was built in 1836, the St. James AME Zion Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. The marker in front notes it became the religious, political, and cultural heart of the community, and in 1841, the site of a school for black children. It was home to Pastor Thomas James and Jermaine Logan and host to Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. The church was the site of many abolitionist meeting, meetings and was a station on the Underground Railroad between Elmira and Auburn. 
Many freedom seekers chose to settle in Ithaca, while many freedom seekers used the church as a safe house on their way north to Canada. Tompkins County historian Carol Kamen has estimated that about 114 people came through Ithaca between 1850 and 1861. If they didn't proceed on to Auburn, they might have gone from Ithaca to this house in Mecklenburg. This is the Parker Whipson Wixom homestead, and it was one of several homes of Quaker families in the Mecklenburg Perry area that undoubtedly must have served as stations on the Underground Railroad. The freedom seekers in this house were hidden in a small room under the kitchen at the back of the house. Probably the next station to the north from this house was Lodi in Seneca County, or possibly the John Siprich House in Burdett. The John Siprich House is the oldest house in Burdett. It was the Underground Railroad station after Mecklenburg when using the route proceeding west on present-day Route 79 between Ithaca or from Watkins Glen. Mary Pratt, who lived in the house in 1938, accidentally tore some wallpaper covering a fireplace. Escaped slaves had painted symbols in black paint on a cover over the fireplace opening. The letters B, T, and C accompany drawings of a pointing hand, an African-American, a cross, shovels, a horse, and a bird in flight. The symbols were intended to represent the slave's flight, as well as the Christian symbols of faith and hope. The places I have talked about so far in Burdett and Mecklenburg have not been fully documented, unlike the sites in Seneca County that I am now going to talk about. In 2005, we local historians began a full year concerted study to document individuals and sites in Seneca County. The year-long study was funded by a grant from the Preservation League of New York State and the New York State Council on the Arts. The Seneca County Historian's Office contracted with Dr. Judith Wellman to do this funded study. Dr. Wellman has done similar studies for other counties that are listed there. The project report is over 700 pages in length, and it is completely accessible on the Seneca County website. Historians have to deal with oral tradition stories that might not have sound historical facts to back them up. Dr. Wellman in her research work invented what has become known as the Wellman rating scale. If there is an oral tradition story that, that a certain house was a station on the Underground Railroad, she would give that property a level two rating. If evidence can be found to support that oral tradition story, for that particular place, then it could be raised to level three or four. If what I call smoking gun evidence could be found to remove any doubt about that place being involved in underground railroad activity, then it could be raised to level five. However, if evidence is found to tend to disprove the validity of the oral tradition about some place, then it would be lowered to level one. An example of this is the night house at 96 State Street in Seneca Falls, which for years there was the oral tradition that it was an actual station on the Underground Railroad, largely because the house was near the train station so as to hide a runaway slave there until the train actually arrived in Seneca Falls. Our Seneca County study research assistant found that this house was not even built until 1871, after the Civil War. 
That's why it's level one. Now to get to places in Southern Seneca County and people in Southern Seneca County. Silas Halsey was a trained doctor who after his wife died, he came to Lodi in 1793. He had a distinguished career, including serving in both houses of the New York State Legislature and in the United States House of Representatives. Like many early settlers in Seneca County and elsewhere in the Finger Lakes, Silas Halsey brought his slave prime with him when he came to settle in what became Lodi, New York. In 1793, Dr. Halsey and his slave prime together cleared land and built a small log house at Cooley's Point, or Lodi Landing. The next year, Halsey brought the rest of his family. In 1794, Dr. Halsey and his slave prime built this three federal bay, three bay federal house on Ovid Lot 37. The street address today is 8375 Route 414 in Lodi. You may have known this house as the Crystal Springs tourist home for many years. There is no documentation that Dr. Halsey elk actually helped any freedom seekers on their way north, probably simply because Dr. Halsey died in 1832, well before the main years of most freedom seekers escaping their enslavement in the South. Another example of a white settler bringing his slaves with him is Robert Rose, who first settled on the farm that became known later as Rose Hill. Robert Rose was trying to set up a plantation type agriculture using slave labor, but he found that approach not to be profitable here in the Finger Lakes, largely because of cotton, excuse me, because of climate and what crops could and couldn't be growing here. So he eventually freed his slaves. It is reasonable to suspect that these freed slaves may well have provided some assistance to freedom seekers who came later. Kwam Demund is an example of an African-American born in slavery who became a landowner in the town of Covert in Seneca County. This circa 1874 map shows the location of his home, which is no longer standing. Quam DeMond was born in New Jersey about 1796, and he was a veteran of the War of 1812. We don't know exactly when he came to Seneca County, but we know he married a Lydia, and Lydia died in Ovid on July 23rd, 1842. Quam and Lydia had six children. About 1844, Quam married a Phoebe, and they had 10 children. In May 1852, Quam Demon paid Sebring and Elizabeth Smalley the sum of $2,500 for 50 acres of land, a house, a barn, and livestock in the town of Covert on this portion of Lot 59 shown. The location is shown on the arrow on the map. In November 1852, Quam Demon paid $200 for two more adjoining acres. Quam and his family lived on this farm. He died there June 4, 24, 1877. His widow lived there for a few more years. Here you see Quam DeMong's mark on his last will and testament. This means that he couldn't even write his name. Note also another prominent white of the area, Peter Tunison, was the witness to this last will and testament of Quam DeMong. 
In the project report, there was a database of all identified African Americans in Seneca County between 1880, 20 and 1880. Shown here are all of the demands of Quam and his wives, Lydia and Phoebe. This is a close up of the appendix for Quam Demand and several of his many family members. You will note how much detailed information there has been compiled in this database. Here's another project database, and you can see the very detailed information for Quam and Lydia Demun. The West Lodi Cemetery is the burial place of Pompey Demund and Franklin Scott, formerly enslaved, and Silas Halsey as a former slave owner. Poppy DeMunn was a former slave born in New Jersey who was a farm laborer in Lodi. The 1870 census lists him as living with John Crisfield, a retired farmer. The 1870 census lists Pompey DeMund is having $300 worth of personal property. At the time of his death, January 4th, 1876, Pompey DeMund was living with Ford Miller of Lodi, as Pompey DeMund had no relatives. He was 67 years old at the time of his death. The administration papers submitted by Ford Miller said that Pompey DeMunn's personal property consisted of clothing, a watch, books, sheep shears, and horse brush. So we get some idea of what kind of work he was probably doing as a laborer. This is the gravestone of Silas Halsey in the West Lodi Cemetery. Shown here is the Scott family gravestone in the West Lodi Cemetery. Frank Scott was born in Salem, North Carolina in April 1853. The 1870 census lists him as age 20, however, as an African-American farm laborer living with the Herman Halsey family. By 1880, Frank Scott and his wife Susan were living in Lodi, as an independent family with their three children, Johnny, Hattie, and Fanny. In June 1887, Frank Scott bought a lot on Park Street in Ovid. The 1894 Directory of Seneca County listed the Scott family as living on Orchard Street in Lodi. Frank Scott died December 1903. This is one of my favorite stories. Henry Bainbridge is one of the slaves that the Bainbridge family brought with them when they settled in the Willard area in the early 1790s. Slaves typically took the last name of their master or slave owner. That's why Henry becomes known as Henry Bainbridge. Henry was freed when his master, Malin Bainbridge, di uh, <clears throat> died in 1814. But Malin had gotten Henry to agree to stay on the farm, the Bainbridge family farm, and work the land until Malin's youngest sons were old enough to work the farm themselves. So Henry agreed, he stayed on the farm for 10 years more, and he worked the farm on shares, keeping one third of the crop as his own share. He made enough money that in 1825, he bought a 100 acre farm in Middlesex area of Yates County. He dies there, he's buried there in the Middlesex area, but in 1925, 
members of the Bainbridge family have his remains exhumed and brought to the Bainbridge family plot in the Rising Cemetery in Willard and buried there in the Bainbridge family plot. And they have this gravestone erected with his name on it. This is a wonderful example of how there can be very strong bonds of loyalty that developed between some slave masters and their slaves. On this one street, Seneca Street in Ovid, there were the homes of three African-American families living. I'm going to uh, deal with each one separately, but I want to emphasize two points. First, the white families of the area must have at least accepted these African-American families living here in Ovid. Uh, and they must have felt fairly safe as a result to choose to live there. Secondly, these back, black families had to be able to have work, so there must have been job opportunities for them. One of them is Charlotte Jackson. She was freed from slavery and worked for many years in the household of an anti-slavery family working for Bell Ayers in the town of Varick along Cayuga Lake. She is the only known African-American woman to sign an anti-slavery petition sent to Congress in January 1849 by 86 women in total from Seneca County, but she was the only African-American woman to sign it. Shown here is her house on Seneca Street in Ovid as it looks today. Also shown is her gravestone in the Ovid Cemetery where she and her son Jerome are buried. Just up the street is the Richard Van Horn home. Richard Van Horn was born in New Jersey in 1806, probably came to Seneca County as the slave of the Van Horn family. He was manumitted or freed at some point. He marries a woman named Hannah, and he and his wife have several children. In 1847, Richard Van Horn received land in Franklin County from Garrett Smith, what I had alluded to earlier, so that Richard Van Horn could meet the then New York State requirement for black, free black males to own so much property to be able to vote. Out of appreciation for Garrett Smith, their next single born son was named Garrett Smith Van Horn. This son, Garrett Smith Van Horn, died in Ovid in 1937, and at the time, he was believed to be the oldest active fireman in all of New York State. In 1850, the Van Horn family bought this home in Hannah's name for $700. This is because in 1848, the New York State Legislature had passed a Married Women's Property Act. Moses and Ann Bryan and George and Mary Bryan are examples of enslaved African Americans who came to New York State in slavery, were freed in the early 19th century, and remained here in the state to buy property and create a stable life for themselves. Moses Bryan, like Richard Van Horn, received land in 1847 from Garrett Smith so he could meet property qualifications to vote. He died sometime before 1860. His widow, Ann Bryant, in the 1870 census was listed as living with her son, Moses, and that she was 100 years old 
with a note that her father had been born in Africa. That son, Moses Bryan, had been born about 1827 and died June 27, 1902, after recently being taken to the Willard State Hospital for treatment. His obituary noted, however, that he was respected by all in the community. Now for a, a likely station on the Underground Railroad in the narrowest sense of the word. The David and Mary Kinney House was strongly believed to be such a station. It was believed that freedom seekers would come from Ovid Landing or Willard today, up from Seneca Lake to this Kinney House. There they would be hidden until they could proceed on to Seneca Falls or Waterloo, probably going first to the Steel House in the hamlet of Romulus. It is through this upstairs doorway that we believe the freedom seekers probably were hidden in the windowless attic portion of the house. This is the Richard Steele house on Seneca Street in the hamlet of Romulus. The one and a half story wing to the left of the main part of the house today was the original part of the house dating back to 1822. This wing contained an attic room for passengers on the Underground Railroad. A Dutch oven fireplace there is said to have been a source of comfort for these passengers. I'm using Underground Railroad vocabulary. The freedom seekers were possible would very possibly came from the Kinney House to this steel house and then proceeded on to Seneca Falls or Waterloo. In our year-long Underground Railroad study, we couldn't find clear documenting evidence that this steel house was an Underground Railroad station. But here is a 1965 Geneva Times article that does provide some information about this house as a station on the Underground Railroad. Here you see an 1837 notice that a meeting was to be held in the Methodist Church in Seneca Falls to organize the Seneca County Anti-Slavery Society. The names that were signed to this notice are some of the most prominent businessmen and political figures of the communities of Seneca Falls and Waterloo at the time. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through Seneca Falls and Waterloo sites. I'll just make some quick comments. First, once the freedom seekers left the Romulus Ovid area, they likely proceeded north to Seneca Falls or Waterloo, where many got on the train to proceed to Rochester and on to Canada. Here, shown here are some noteworthy sites in Seneca Falls. Top left is the Wesleyan Chapel, which all of you probably know is the site of the first Women's Rights Convention in July 1848. But this congregation was formed as an anti-slavery, biracial church. The church's parsonage was frequently used by the pastors as a station on the Underground Railroad. Shown at top right is the historic marker for the cobblestone house on Lower Lake Road. Probably Quakers from the Sherwood Union Springs area in Cayuga County facilitated freedom seekers to cross Cayuga Lake to this home of Julius Bull, who would then get them to the train station in Seneca Falls. Shown at bottom left is the Seneca Woolen Mills, built by anti-slavery businessmen in Seneca Falls, who wanted an alternative to the cotton mills. Cotton was a slave labor produced cloth, unlike sheep's wool that could be produced on Seneca County Farm. Shown at bottom right is the home of Thomas James. He was a freedom seeker himself, who settled in Seneca Falls and became a prosperous barber. With his house located next to the train station in Seneca Falls, he probably aided several freedom seekers to get on the train in Seneca Falls. 
There are some interesting sites in Waterloo. Shown at top left is the home of Richard P. Hunt. He was a Quaker and probably the wealthiest man in Seneca County before the Civil War. He used his carriage house as a station on the Underground Railroad. You may know that you may know this house is the site of the July 9th, 1848 gathering of five ladies who decided to call the Seneca Falls Convention. Shown at top right is the Waterloo Woolen Mills. Like what I said about the Woolen Mill in Seneca Falls, Richard P. Hunt and other anti-slavery businessmen in Waterloo started this woolen mill as an alternative to slave-grown cotton. Shown at bottom left is the residence of Thomas and Mary Ann McClintock. They were reformist Quakers, very much involved in anti-slavery efforts in Waterloo. Shown at bottom right is one of many Quaker farm families, the Bonnells, in the Waterloo Junius area that were very much involved in Quaker anti-slavery efforts. Shown at the center is the Quaker Cemetery on the Nine Foot Road, where many Quaker anti-slavery activists are buried, and the site of the Junius Monthly Meeting House, as it was called. I hope that this program has given you some insight into the many different forms that anti-slavery efforts or Underground Railroad in its broadest meaning took in the years leading up to the Civil War. Although it was illegal under provisions of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 to give aid to freedom seekers, there were many strong anti-slavery people in the Finger Lakes region, including Southern Seneca County, willing to defy this law and embrace a higher moral law. If you wish more information about the Underground Railroad in Seneca County and you don't have time to pose me a question in this program, please feel free to contact me as shown in the frame. I hope that you have more insight and you can go to this website and view the whole 700 page project report.